Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Welcome back to HealingYourself.Life. We are with our off-grid MD, Jay Nielsen, again. This time we're going to talk about how do I get pain relief during the opioid crisis. We've seen no end to escalating stories in the news about the seriousness and gravity of the opioid crisis and its effect on many people and on their families. And there's financial impacts as well. There's Im impacts on employers. It's, uh, it's a bad deal all around. And uh, there's it's, it's especially hard hitting hard on people who have legitimate needs for pain management and are unable to get that met. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it's quite interesting. I mentioned in an earlier episode when I went in because of Lyme carditis uh, to, the, to the hospital, they started asking me some questions that were very strange to me about what, what about this and what about that. I was like, I don't use any of that stuff, but evidently that's something that's really on their radar recently, oh. something they have to be watching out for. But it, it can be tough for people who have a legitimate need for pain relief. And if you could walk us through what are some of the issues and what are some of the ways out. Yep. Well, as always, I want to uh, do a little bit of um, stuff that's in the bit news. They published a survey. We well, really ought to frighten us all. And 50% of all physicians in the United States are over 55 years of age. They're projecting a 121,000 physician shortage in the next 12 years. Uh, medical schools, lowest number ever. Medical residencies, lowest number ever. Fewest number of internists and family docs ever going into the match. And meanwhile, they think they're all going to solve it with family nurse practitioners, which I talk about all the time. Here's an article that was in the family practice journals about the fact that the dermatologists are getting rid of them all because they say that they, they can't do it. Okay. Yeah, for those who are interested, please look up our uh, video called... Uh, Robbing us blind, the medical That's system right. has us right where they want us, uh, because one of the tactics, we know that it's not the doctors getting rich. In fact, if they were getting rich, they'd still be going to med school to That's go right. get rich. That's right. But it's a terrible job. They've been squeezed, and the patients have been squeezed, and the people who haven't been squeezed are the hospital administrators and the drug manufacturers. Uh, but that's another. That's a topic for, another, topic for, another, for another day. Yeah. This was interesting. This came to me the other day. How come there isn't a medical Snowden? Okay. Why isn't there one person in the world that's in the inside of this mess, a senator's office, number three guy at the FDA, that decides it's time to sit down in front of a camera and go, you people are all being screwed, okay? And I, and I just marvel at it. So anyway, I want to throw those up before we get started today. So today we're talking about the op op opioid crisis. I can't spell that word. I-O-I-D, that's so unnatural, so therefore I can't say it. Um, and you have to realize where doctors were in this. We really didn't see ourselves as providing a lot of pain relief. I wrote very few narcotics in the 80s. As I got into the 90s, all of a sudden, I had all of these drug reps showing up in my office with these really cool products with really nice lines. Hey, this stuff's not addicting. Look at this. The FDA let us say that they're not addicting. Um, you really are doing a disservice to your patients not to treat them. Um, I would give these to patients and patients would come back and they'd really like them. Okay. And uh, then as we got later into the 90s, then the government got involved. And I'm going to show you some documentation on this. And we ended up with a program called Pain the Fifth Vital Sign. And the purpose of it was to get us not to just do temperature, pulse, respiration, but, and blood pressure, but to actually go, here's your pain score. And we got the little I'm smiley face thing and the I'm sad thing. And but for doctors, it was different because we had the Joint Commission for Accreditation reviewing our charts and telling hospitals that they had to pay penalties because we didn't give out enough narcotics. We had people 
coming from the state medical board and telling us that they would testify against us if we didn't give enough narcotics to our patients. And, none, you know, the, this was all pain, the fifth vital sign, okay? And, and so we went all the way through the late 90s and the early OOs, okay, living in, in that world. And as we did that, everybody did that. And then all of a sudden, the state medical board started tapping the brakes. Not hard, but starting to tap the brakes. And you started watching people in the community that had drive up windows for narcotics in their office and were only taking cash, ending up on the front page. But it always amazed me that it always took five years to bust those guys. Mm -hmm. Seemed to me like you could have busted them in 30 minutes. They had girls on roller skates bringing paper bags with drugs and new prescriptions, you know, out to the cars. And we had them here in my community. And that made everybody go, well, I don't want to be seen like that guy. So a lot of the family docs got out. Internists never got in, okay? And it slowly came down until I got to the point, because I specialized in pain management, that I was kind of like the last family practice pain doc in a community of a few hundred thousand people. And so I had to meet the standards of pain management docs. So I'm doing drug screens and writing contracts and et cetera. And all of that was fine. I, it, it didn't really cause me a, a lot of problems until we really got down to this opioid epidemic. When the opioid epidemic came, everything changed because now they had a new standard of care that scared those guys and they were professional at it, okay? And all of a sudden, I saw this coming. So I had 386 active pain patients in my practice and I just right away made plans to ship them off to the 25 guys in my community. But they weren't buying them. They weren't going to take them. And hmm. so I had plans to taper them all off of their meds. And, of course, some of those people did really poorly, et cetera. Um, and that's how we kind of got to today, you know. And now you're going in and picking up probably less than a third of the correct dose to control your pain from a pain management doc who has seen you every month charging your insurance company $2,500 for a drug screen, making a killing, doing a level four visit, charging 150 bucks, seeing you for two minutes. And every visit threatening you, I think I'll take you down the next month. Yeah, that's where we've landed. And so now we're down to all pain management, they're called PMRs, pain management rehabilitation doctors. Okay, we used to call them physiatrists, um, who um, are now in charge of all his pain meds. And there are not nearly enough to do all of the pain work in the United States. And they're not particularly nice people. And their staff is not nice. And you kind of feel like you're sitting in a drug mill again, except for now it's a legitimate drug mill. And that's where we've landed, okay? Um, and so one of the things I want to do today is I want to illustrate to people the thought process of that PMR doc. Mm -hmm. What does he want from you? Okay, because what he wants to do is trade you a month's prescription for a $4,000 procedure. And he wants to keep doing bigger and bigger procedures on you while you continue to get your pain meds and not thrive. And I watch it every day and I'm gonna walk through today what those steps are, okay? But the real problem that's happened is at least in the state of Ohio now, you are no longer allowed to write acute pain medication. You can only write seven days once a year and you cannot go above a MET score of 30, which means that you're not allowed to have more than five milligrams of Percocet four times a day for seven days. So I send you up to my surgeon at Metro in Cleveland and he decides to fuse five of your vertebrae and you're going to be in the hospital for maybe 14 days and maybe in physical therapy for a year and you're gonna get seven days of pain meds for an incision that's a foot long while you put two rods in your back. And these people are coming into me on day eight. Well, they're not coming in, they can't walk yet. And their family's coming in going, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's where we're at. Um, and so with that, what I wanna do is I really wanna kinda of try and you know run through some of the basics. And so the first thing I did is, this is a course that 
I had exposure to recently. And what the, this is, is this is a pain management doc talking about what he does. And I'm just reading the titles off of the slides. Transforaminal epidural steroids, discography, percutaneous disc compression, facet injections, cervical medial branch blocks, radio frequency ablation, cortisone in the sacroiliac joint, sympathetic blockade, lumbar sympathetic blockade. These are procedures. These people. are all procedures. Most of them are probably reimbursed two to five thousand dollars and most of them are very high risk and you may find yourself about every 90 days needing to do one of these to keep your pain doc happy while they don't work and you don't get any better. That's my experience in practice. And then they get down to putting in a hundred and twenty thousand dollar neurostimulator. That's our pain system today. Now, what didn't we talk about? Okay. These guys, you could go to these guys and do your $2,500 a month drug screens and do your $4,000 a month or every 90 day procedures as fast as the insurance company will let them do it. Okay. And in the middle of that, did anybody check you for gout? 10% of all the patients who walk in my practice with failed pain control have gout because they're taking a water pill or they have genetic gout. Okay. Nobody's checking that anymore. When I was in medical school, when I did my orthopedic uh, rotation, yeah, first thing you did, CBC, sed rate, rheumatoid titer, ANA, let's find out whether or not you're inflamed. If you're inflamed, let's not give you pain meds. Let's make the cause of your disease go away. Right. That's the easiest disease in the world to permanently control. Nobody ever knows how to seem to do it. We have a wonderful new drug called Euloric that just fixes everybody within days and everybody's still on 50-year-old allopurinol. Um, and, um, and so, you know, all these people are getting cortisone and needles in their spine and, you know, et cetera. So um, the second thing that's not happening from these pain management docs is they're not seeing a chiropractor. They're not getting sent to physical therapy. Right. They're not giving conditioning. Program. They'll doff their hat at it. And then the minute the insurance company says, well, you've got to fill out them. Oh, I just happen to not want to fill out that form. But boy, I want to fill out that form for that epidural, okay? And, um, you know, there's no workup and there's no conservative therapy. They do one study, they find out you got an L4-5 right herniated disc, and then they do that entire stack of procedures. They never check your hips. They never examine you to see if you have an unstable sacroiliac. They never look to see if it's referred pain from a cervical disc. They got a diagnosis, and now that becomes their diagnosis, and they're going to do every procedure they can while it doesn't work. That's pain management in America today. And so, you know, I've been, I went out to Vegas about four years ago to the largest pain management meeting in the country. It's called Pain Week, and you can elect to walk into any of 20 meetings in this great big convention center. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they must have had a lot of pressure on them because the kind of medicine that I do of trying to find the cause, there'd be like one meeting every hour on that. And you'd go into that meeting and when you'd get up and leave, the next time you went to a room, it'd be the same, same people. people yeah. <laughs> you know, like 14,000 people at this meeting, I met like 50 people. You know, it was pretty funny. Okay. Oh, my God. And so, um, you know, that's, that's really where, where we landed. But now, to be fair, look on the other side. With 5% of the world's population, we're consuming 80% of all of the narcotics on Earth. And interestingly, the country that's having a big problem with this other than us is Australia. They look like us, which I didn't know until I looked at some of it. And to be fair, this, that bar, the third bar to that bar is one year 11 to 33 opioid deaths past year. Incredible. That's an increase. increase. Yes, big, fast, okay? This is Ohio, my state, okay? And they just kind of randomly, there aren't 88 numbers there. They couldn't fit them all on there. But you'll notice that the numbers get bigger as you head towards West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, famous for that being true, right? And, and my county up there is sitting at nine, which is, you know, about the lowest number out there. And the interesting thing is, is that the cities have lower numbers 
than the country. Huh. Yeah, if you go out to Bumpus, it's more likely your family doc's going to write you a handful of Oxycontin, which is why it's happening in West Virginia. And while we do this, we're getting less and less pain meds. I'm going to show you an example of that. I had a lot of choices 10 years ago. I had all kinds of drugs that had anti-divergence in them, and if you tried to grind them up, they were gelatinous and wouldn't snort. If you tried to dissolve them in water, they did nasty things to you. And um, if you tried to inject them, they had Narcan in them so that you went into withdrawal, and they were called anti-divergent drugs. And interestingly, the federal government has taken them all off the market. The only thing they've left on the market is Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, and, and fentanyl. You can't get any of these good drugs that don't build up tolerance, like Opana. They took Opana off the market. It was the best, best pain med I ever saw. I put people on it. They'd come in at the next visit, and five years later, they were still taking the same dose. They didn't want any more. That research actually showed that the med worked about 20% better at 90 days and stayed there. They took it off the market. The second problem that we're having is everybody automatically goes, I'm in pain, give me a pain pill. I made this list because I had a patient one time that reacted to everything on earth. This is a list of all the things in my compendium that I can use for pain relief. And they're in, they're in categories. Analgesics, there's some blood pressure medicines that do things, muscle relaxers, anti-inflammatories, antidepressants, anticonvulsants, tranquilizers, anti-migraines, antihistamines, steroids. There are lots of things you can do to control pain, okay? But you wouldn't know it to walk into a pain management doc, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and this is what we were talking about as I get back to this. Th these are articles on the fifth vital sign, okay? These are all editorials that go back in my... I have articles that go back 20 years because I've been scanned that long. And it says in here, in retrospect, the fifth vital sign was a mistake. And then they talk about the Joint Commission forcing us all to do things. And of course, we've all by now kind of learned the famous name of the famous company that's behind this, Purdue, right? The Purdue. And, and so, interesting, they're high, and that's 1996. And, you know, all of that is out there. And um, Purdue got a fine all the way back in 2007 for how much? $634 million. Okay. That's probably, they probably made that by lunch on Monday. $634 billion might have been closer to what they could have afforded. Okay. If you want to know, the Sacklers on Purdue and interestingly, we just found out last week that they also own their biggest competition, the number two drug. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. But it didn't just Purdue. FedEx, Walmart, they've all got scams going. I had so many patients that got into these 90-day programs mm. and then their Oxycontin wouldn't come in the mail. And man, Purdue is more than happy to just send it out again three days later. And you go, whoa, 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 wait a second. I just lost 90 days of Oxycontin inside FedEx, okay, or inside the Walmart warehouse. Okay, don't worry about it. And they were laundering all this stuff. And they caught both these companies, both of them got multi-billion dollar fines. Well, if you do the thousand percent markup of the value of Oxycontin on the street, they find them for the market value of Oxycontin. Gosh, I'd stay in that business. You only find me 10% of what I get to sell it for? So, you know, as you know, I've said before, as, Dave, as um, um, David Crosby said one time, who are these men and on what street do they live? You know, the question is, is you know, lots of people know this. Guarantee all you U.S. senators know this. And probably a Purdue stock. Okay. Um, this was interesting. I'm going to start getting into some other issues. A lot of these people that are dying from overdoses, they've got sleep apnea. If you look at the risk, sure, if you get 
four times as much narcotic as you plan to mainline, yeah, you're going to stop breathing and die and wish you on one of those $700 auto injectors that could be a 25 cent syringe, but we won't get into that. You know, all these little auto injectors are also profitable. It's incredible. And everybody needs one in their house now in case a brother-in-law Billy goes down. And uh, the, but you know, the, it's interesting. I haven't heard anybody talking about this research that showed that, you know, hmm. the sleep apnea people, they'll die from therapeutic doses. Uh, I don't hear anybody telling anybody that, okay? Here's the one I was talking about. Um, let me not get it in the wrong order. There we are. 2014, the FDA clears Opana for release on the U.S. market. Nice product. Okay, 2017, abuse deterrent Opana taken off the market. Now all you can get is OxyContin. That's a lot more addicting. That makes sense to me. I went, what? Why would you possibly take that drug away from me? Okay. Um, here, here's that article I was talking about. This is your now your guidelines for acute pain from surgery. No more than seven days of opioids for an adult, no more than five for a minor. Um, and you've got to have all kinds of documentation. And your total morphine equivalent dose can't be above 30, which it, that there's a calculation for okay. that. Um, but cancer patients don't have to worry about that. But everybody else does. Um, Oh, here's a little change in my life to give you a little feeling for how much the state medical board changed the way they felt about pain meds. I received this in 2014. This is medical board news, okay? And it says, beginning October 6, 2014, this is just before the opioid crisis hit the fan, they said Vicodin, Norco, Lortab, and Vicoprofen are being moved from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2 same as OxyContin. This change is extremely important for a few reasons. These products can no longer be phoned into pharmacies and no refills are allowed. 2013, I got patients who are only seeing me twice a year because I'm writing Vicodin 7.5 TID, five refills, here's your script. Right. That was all okay. And then all of a sudden it wasn't okay. I, and I agree, they should have stopped it. But, you know, I don't make the rules. I'm being told that's okay, right? Um, we ought to talk about opioid risk. This is an ORT, okay? This is an opioid risk tool. I'm required by law to fill one of these out before I write a single pill on anybody. And this is valid, some of it's valid stuff. I have to ask, do you have a family history of substance abuse? Mm -hmm alcohol, illegal drugs, or prescription drugs, and mark the box that applies. And if you answer prescription drugs, you get a four. Illegal drugs, you get a two. And alcohol, you get a one. But if you're a male, add two to all of those. Okay. Personal history of substance abuse, I get the same numbers plus one. If I'm older, I get a point. If I have a history of having been sexually abused as a female, I get three points. Sexually abused males don't get any points. Uh, whoever did this has no idea how much more traumatized sexual males are, <laughs> okay? And all of the craziest people I've ever met were traumatized sexual males, not females. And if I've got ADD, okay, I ought to stay away from it. Um, and I'm crazy and I'm depressed. And then if I, get more than eight points, I am considered high risk. Let's see. I'm a male, and my mom was addicted to everything but illegal drugs, so I'm at seven. I'm in the first category. And personally, I was alcoholic. I'm at 10. Yeah, I get a four for that. It's 14. No prescription drugs. 15. And I got ADD. I got a 17. And I'm high risk at 8. I don't think you could pass that thing. Now, that's an interesting story. That's longer to talk about my pain relief. I can't take pain meds. I have dystonia. And if you give me any kind of psych drugs or anything, I can get all spasmed up. 
And um, I had my kidney out for kidney cancer two years ago. And I got a long list of allergies, but the very first one's morphine, okay, because I do really crazy things on morphine. And so they sent me from, recover from surgery to recovery, and in recovery, with my chart in great big letters in red saying morphine, they started a morphine pump on me. And they sent me to ICU, and my wife goes with me into ICU, and I'm there for about 20 minutes, and they've come in and done their paperwork and laid me down in bed, transferred me over on the bed, and no more than get done doing the things that stimulate me. And Jan looks up and sees that my respirations are zero. And she asked me a question, and I don't answer, and then my pulse starts going up, and then it starts going down, and she yells for help, and she hits the emergency button, and nobody comes. And fortunately, my stepson is a board-certified interventionalist cardiologist, and he was the last person she talked to, and he'd been there all day with me for surgery, thank heavens. And she hit redial, and David said, "Is he got a gray thing in his hand with a red button on it. She said, yeah, take it out of his hand, throw it on the ground, put the bed rail down, get up on the bed, and get your knuckle and start digging into his sternum as hard as you can and scream. And so my wife's screaming in ICU. She needs help. And over about 15 minutes, I finally started fighting her a little bit. My respirations came back up to six. And after 15 minutes, the nurse stuck her head in and said, do you need water? Not breathing is not a sustainable plan. No, no. And I go, you know, wow. I had it written on my chart. And that's the reason why I tell everybody I would never be admitted to a hospital in the United States and not have a significant other who was dedicated to staying 24 seven with me and watching everything that happened and questioning everything that happens. That was my pain story. And the interesting thing is next morning, I, I was really terrified because I know I can't take pain meds. And so I thought, man, I'm getting really major surgery here. And I kind of think of myself as a weenie. And my wife's kind of looking at me going, really, I don't think you're a weenie. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I think I am. <laughs> and the next morning they come in, they say, we're going to get you up. They got four people and they're going to go through this thing and get me up. And I went, oh, okay. I put the side rail down and sat up and stood up. And they went, no, 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 not yet. And I went, why? You know, well. Later in the day, I didn't feel quite so good. Yeah, I had him give me 15 milligrams of IV Toradol, an anti-inflammatory. Lasted three days. It was fine. Never took any pain meds. Had an nephrectomy. You know, where's the creativity and care? You know, they all wanted me on narcotics. Mm. So, um, let's see. What do we got here? No, not that one. I'm going to get back to that. Uh, there's that MET thing. This is a ruling that I got that you're not allowed to go above 80. So how do we know all of this stuff? What's the, what's the ball and chain they're putting on doctors so that you know who to call in, take before the board, and jerk their license? Okay. Although I got to tell you, honestly, I just looked today just to be sure. The most common reason that the state medical board takes a doctor's license is because he bounced out of rehab too many times or he slept with too many patients. They never seem to lose their license for being incompetent, addicted, or writing too many pain scripts. They didn't have any this month, okay? Here is how they follow me. And by the way, if you didn't know where Obama went after he quit being president, there he is. He's working at ORS, okay? Isn't that great, okay? This is an ORS report. That's the Ohio Automated Prescription Reporting System. Okay, And I go in and I put in my email and my password and then I fill in the patient's name, their zip code, their date of birth, and that should narrow them down to giving me a score. And this particular patient who's been blacked out has a Narcotic score of 511 and a sedative score of 420 and a stimulant score of 20. Um, he's pretty medicated. It's not my score. I do. This is some. He goes to somebody else, but I'm, he's coming in tomorrow. So I looked him up, and his overdose risk is 420, which because his narcotics aren't very high, 
is okay. He's mostly amphetamines because he has ADD. Okay, and I get this neat little chart that shows me that he has six doctors, and only one of them is writing scripts on him, and one other guy was writing scripts on him a year ago. That's me, and I quit. And he's got his new doc doing everything now. Okay, and then this is a list of every doc, every script, every date, every amount, every pharmacy, every hospital, every ER, pages and pages and pages of documentation. They might as well put a chip in your head. <coughs> they got you. They know exactly what you're doing. Okay. Um, let's skip that one. Oh. I wanted to spend a little bit of time, since we're talking about dangerous meds, about protecting your meds, okay? Um, and if you go up in Google and type in, you know, how do I protect my medication from theft and damage, you're going to come up with one of these pages. There's lots of them out there, okay? Um, but I'm going to keep it really, really simple, okay? I have had people come out of a pharmacy walk to their car, open up their thing, drop their Percocet in, and walk into Kroger's and come out of Kroger's and the glass was broken in their car because somebody stood in the pharmacy and watched them and they said the wrong thing. They said, you know, are you sure you got my Percocet right? Flagged themselves for damage. Um, or they may be known. They may be a known chronic pain patient and somebody's following them around. I have had so many visiting family members steal all the meds out of the Lazy Susan in the middle of the kitchen table. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Mm -hmm. And empty the medicine cabinets. We see the ads on TV, you know, all of this stuff. Um, there are two things that I, three things that I always tell people to do is uh, don't ever take your meds off of your person until they're secure. Don't ever put them in the car, okay? Make getting your meds last thing you do okay all meds because people will rob you for your blood pressure meds hoping they get narcotics and so just having a rexall bag is a good way to get robbed don't walk around with your rexall bag okay stick it in your kroger bag okay make it make it visually disappear um number one okay number two don't stand at the pharmacy and talk about controlled substances because Anybody who hears you, you're making yourself a mark, okay? The third thing is, don't take all of your meds home and leave them someplace unsecure. I tell all of my patients, if you have a one month supply of meds, save an old bottle and keep one week of meds wherever you're going to put it and put all the rest of them in a secure place, okay? So let's talk about secure places. They should call them anti-medicine cabinets, okay? Not medicine cabinets, okay? The perfect place to keep something is someplace where people wouldn't look, someplace that's dark, dry, and sees no ambient change in temperature, so mm -hmm. it's effectively insulated, mm -hmm. okay? That's a sock drawer, okay? Or, or underwear drawer or sweater drawer or wherever. But if you take all of your meds and somebody has to go through every drawer in your house to find them, you've done yourself a favor, okay? But it's not the right way to do it. These are a hundred bucks. I have one in my office because I'm required to keep testosterone locked up by state law because it's a controlled substance, okay? And these things work by key and combination and you can just take a a drywall saw and cut out the little map they give you when you unfold it put your four pins in draw your things and it slides in you put drywall screws in through the sides and now you can't get it out and sure you could if you came in with enough demolition equipment but everything is snatch and grab nobody's going to come in and take a sawzall and cut four studs and break the wall up you know that's going to stop things and so really all of your meds no matter what kind of meds they are really should be put away, mm -hmm. okay? I had a, a fascinating story with a little old lady about a year ago, and I had to talk to my son about this because he works in the inner city, and he said, yeah, all this stuff's true. And I went, God, I didn't know this. 
And she came in and I said, Ethel, I said, you haven't refilled any of your meds for more than a year. Are you having somebody else do it? She said, no. I said, don't, don't you need prescriptions? And she says, no. And I said, are you not taking your meds? She said, yeah, I'm taking all my meds. And I said, okay, you got me. I don't get it. She said, you know much about the inner city, doc? And I said, no. And she said, well, you know, all these dopers that are all robbing all of these, these people for their meds, they don't just go in and grab the Oxycontin and the Xanax. They just clean the whole cabinet off, okay? And when they get done, they get... Lipitor and low pressure and everything and and they have no use for them. They just give them to me. Sometimes they charge me a little bit, but I probably don't spend fifty dollars a year on meds now. Did there, you know that? There's a sole beneficiary of the uh, of the opioid crisis. Yeah, did you know that? No, I, I didn't know that. And I went, wow. And so I called my son up and I said, and he says, oh, there's an entire black there. He says some of these guys are running virtual pharmacies and they've got them alphabetized and, and people can stop by and say, you know, and they say, well, we don't have any 40s today, but I can get you 80s and you can cut them in half. And, and they said, and, it, and I went, I had no idea that there was a black market for traditional drugs. And most of them, she says, sometimes they run a little short and I have to change beta blockers, but they know which one and, well, crazy stuff. Okay, okay, shift gears again. It's a great pain reliever, Tylenol. As long as you're not a drinker. Drink alcohol, right? Right. Real bad combination. Chronic alcohol use. Okay. Um, but there are... This one is 2005. This one's 2003. And you don't see much in the literature in the last decade about how effective Tylenol is. But when I was a drug researcher for the FDA... I did a dental study one time with a local dentist and they ran it through my office and I did all the paperwork. And we compared Tylenol to Tylenol number four to Darvacet, which was back then about all we used for pain relief, okay? And in this study- and Tylenol four included codeine? Codeine, I, yeah. I Tylenol, yeah. Yeah, no, right, number three, number two, yeah. okay, half a grain, whole grain, et cetera. And um, you could hardly separate the impact of Tylenol from Tylenol with narcotics. And yet, do you ever have your dentist say, hey, why don't you try some Tylenol? Okay, let's, um, let's talk about side effects of narcotics, okay? Low testosterone, low testosterone, low testosterone, study after study, after study. I have many, many of my workers' comp patients that I got him approved for hypogonadism secondary to opioid chronic use. And if you type in hypogonadism plus opioids in Google Scholar, it. Uh, I didn't get the thing that says how many, how many there were. Find, yeah. yeah, I think it was 1,300 studies. Okay. And so if you're in pain and your pain med lowers your testosterone. And testosterone is the hormone that makes you heal. And low testosterone causes depression. And depression makes pain worse. And antidepressants lower testosterone. Down you go. Down you go, okay. I took a wonderful course at Pain Week. This is one of my, my meetings I was at that was logical from a wonderful guy by the name of John Tennant. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, orthopedist who teaches pain management and he said first thing you got to do is you got to recognize that lots of medication okay deplete pregnenolone cortisol DHEA progesterone estradiol thyroid and testosterone okay and so you got to fix those the second thing is you got to recognize your adrenals are weak and you got to do adrenal repair with adaptogens okay and finally when you get done these meds have completely screwed up all of your neurochemistry in your brain, mm. which is why you get withdrawal, right? I think we might have covered this in our last one. They've just made CBDs illegal in right. Ohio, even from hemp. 
Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's now about a four or five week old article. Incredible. And as you said when you walked in, doesn't seem to be true. They're still selling it at the store. And I said, well, the purpose was to slow people down. It, well, they're not going to go out and bust people for selling hemp in a state that passed medical marijuana laws and then wouldn't implement it. Okay. This is a funny story. Smoking and pain. I was, I was the pleasure to be the partner to the greatest spine surgeon in the United States. He innovated most of the changes people do today. Here's another one. Smoking increases pain. Smoking quadruples your risk of disc breakdown. Smoking quadruples your risk of spine surgery failing. Therefore, if you smoke, get disc disease, and have surgery, you have a 1,600% increased risk of having a failed back. Hmm. Biphosphonates cause pain. Hello, we're giving you a med for osteoporosis. One I would never take on my deathbed. It's so dangerous. It's called postmenopausal osteoporosis. Fix your hormones. But is anybody telling the people who are using these biphosphonates like Fosamax? You know, that they ought to do that. Here's an ad for gout. We already, you know, talked about gout. Okay. Um, you know, these guys are out there doing a facet injection. Okay. And... I took a picture of this on my chiropractor's wall. He's smarter than my orthopedic surgeon, okay? And he said, then here's your remedial biology on the cause of pain. Scoliosis, deconditioned muscles, sacroiliac joint pain, sciatica, stenosis, herniated disc, disc degeneration, pinched nerve, arthritic joints, and muscular tension. Well, only two of those are going to respond to an epidural. Mm -hmm. We're not, they're not bothering to do a workup. Here's a good one. Everybody know about Kraton? No. It's spelled a number of ways. It's an herb out of South America, and it greatly helps withdrawal from narcotics, and it is in and of itself an excellent pain reliever, and it's not addicting. And this is a journal article from the American Academy of Family Practice saying, is Kraton the answer to the opioid crisis? I would suggest that you go type Kraton, sometimes it's C-R-A-T-O-M, Sometimes it's C-R-A-E-T-O-M, okay, because um, that's European, okay? And read a little bit about Kratom and ask yourself why we're not being told about this herb, okay? Here's one. Just wrote it this morning. Low-dose naltrexone, okay? Naltrexone is the drug that we give an overdose to block the narcotic effect. So what pain patient wants to be on something that blocks pain meds, okay? And yet, among patients taking more than four LDN prescriptions in an average year, opioid consumption was reduced by 41% compared to the previous year. Conclusions, LDN is an excellent pain reliever because it renormalizes opioid receptors, hmm. okay? So having said all of that, I know everybody already knows that, you know, I'm going to say, you know, take your glucosamine, okay, 3,000 milligrams a day, put your shark liver oil, natural relief 1222, we've been through this, use your oral peptides, Arthroben, right, my favorite story, injectable homeopathics, 15 years old, Worked great. My entire life was transformed by Guna injectables. Five years after I bought them, the government came out and said injectable homeopathics are dangerous. Really? Come on. That's an oxymoron that a homeopathic can be dangerous. They don't even go out of date. Okay? Um, and so there's lots and lots of conservative things to do. And you go back in my life, and I was doing prolotherapy in the 90s and injecting dextrose and lidocaine and rebuilding ligaments. You know, now... I'm doing platelet-rich plasma, right? And we've talked about that. You know, here's an article out of the newspaper about some long jumper, and it says in the top line, um, where was it? Not only this guy, but Tiger Woods, etc. Tiger Woods didn't win the FedEx Cup last week because of PRP. That didn't get him back into golf years ago. We'll talk about what did get him through the FedEx Cup, okay? Here's a study 
published by the Chinese. The Chinese are very, very interested in anything that works, is safe, and is cheap because they got two billion people and they're starting to demand health care. And they took 1,423 patients and truly double-blinded them to an injection. One person put the needle in, another person put the solution in behind a screen. No one knew anything. They truly, the first double-blind injection study I've ever heard done. And they compared platelet-rich plasma to placebo, synvisc, ozone, and steroids. Okay? And at 12 months, PRP beat them all. And it's still going on, the study, and the PRP is still working, and everything wore off in weeks on all the other therapies, except Synvisc, which is six months. So what's PRP? You take 80 mLs of blood, you put it in a centrifuge at 4,000 4, 4, RPMs for 13 minutes, and it separates into plasma, a scummy layer, and blood. And just underneath that scummy layer called the Buffy coat is a very thin one millimeter thick layer of cells called platelet-rich plasma. And I can do anything I want with that. I can inject it in your scalp and hair will grow. I can do a facelift with it. People are doing it in, in Europe and in Florida for the old people. I can put it inside your joint, rebuild cartilage. I can inject it into a tendon, fix your rotator cuff. But pretty much I can stop almost any pain with platelet-rich plasma. Is anybody being told this? No. No, of course not. Okay. So here's Tiger Woods. Just started doing this five months ago. I was one of the first people in the country to start on tailor-made peptides. And you'll see this one over here. Tendon repair. Okay. These are injectable peptides. Once a day, subcutaneous, 0.1 ml. And this company came out with BPC-157, type it all in, no spaces, it'll come right up in the internet, you can read about BPC-157, and BPC-157 was so popular with professional athletes that the company couldn't get ahead of the professional athletes to start giving it to doctors. They had to build another factory. Hmm. And I just started getting to get it five months ago, and I think I've mentioned before, it just cures Crohn's disease in two weeks, hmm. okay? And, um, and it is genuinely, peptides are absolutely the future of medicine. They are just absolutely incredible. And I guarantee you that Tiger Woods is doing peptides. That's why he won the FedEx on that money on it. Low vitamin D causes pain. Low vitamin D in kids causes pain. Pain ain't what you think it is. And as you pointed out, you're not hearing about these uh, safer alternatives and the people who are specialists, so-called specialists in treating pain, aren't actually trying to, f to create health. They're just going through procedures that are profitable. Absolutely. And, and, and using narcotics the way you'd use a worm on a hook to reel them in. Yep. That's a grim state of affairs. So you mentioned uh, a few things, how to store drugs safely, how to obtain them safely. Uh, you talked about the need for uh, a personal advocate and monitor to be with you if you're going to be hospitalized. Absolutely. Um, other, other tips for people to, I guess, they, they could seek out pro, uh, providers who are versed in platelet-rich plasma. It's a good point. Let's peptides. tell them how to do that. If you go up and type in the American Association of Orthopedic Medicine, you're going to find an organization with about 1,400 doctors all over the United States. I don't think the website lists the people from all over the world. Uh, and you can put in your zip code and it'll do the less than 50 mile thing. And you may end up driving 100, 200 miles to find somebody. I have patients coming a long distance to me. I, I don't know who my competition is. They're so far away they're not affecting me. Uh, I'm the only person in Northwest Ohio. Um, and you can find somebody who does this, who thinks like I do. You know, I make this stuff up. I learned it at AOM. There's also another association called the American Association, the American Osteopathic Association of Prolotherapy, and I believe they changed their name to, from prolotherapy to integrative pain management. 
and they are acopms.com. And both of those organizations do what I've been to, like the people, good teachers, um, and they both got, look, you know, put your zip code in and find, find a, out where find, you're at. Find a provider. If you want to find somebody who knows how to do this stuff, PRP, supplements, fixing your hormones, detoxification, things I'm doing, find it that way. You've also mentioned some uh, herbal uh, options that people can search as well, so uh, they'll be able to find those by keeping your notes as they watch this video. Right. Uh, also, remember to also watch Dr. Jane Nielsen's video, Are You Managing Your Pain or Are Healing Your Pain? And uh, how you protect yourself from injury. And uh, Dr. Nielsen, thank you as always for joining us here on HealingYourself.life. Pleasure. Thank you.